<laughs> but, but most people don't like it. Most of the customers say, everybody says, you have to get rid of it. And that's because it's an invader and it takes <clears throat> over most, most of the parts. So. But in the 13th century, they used, I, I, I would have an example here, but I forgot to bring a piece of wood, where it's yellowish, when you cut into it, and kind of reddish. So uh, that material there was used as a cathartic. It's kind of a, you know, a cathartic means it's <clears throat> purge your intestinal system. And if, if used wisely, you can still do that. And they have used this in medicine many years ago and also for hemorrhoids, things like this. So, uh, buckthorn isn't all bad. You know, there's some good things about it. It gives birds severe diarrhea. Oh! Really? It's one Which is how the so seeds fast. spread <laughs> so fast. Well, oh, no. that yeah. is fact that I didn't know. That is interesting. Yeah, yeah I, it, the birds ingest the seeds, you know, and then, of course, after they pass through the intestines, they're ready to germinate. So they fly all over the place, right? By that That's how it's and disseminated. So we call birds something like that, vector, V-E-C-T-O-R-S, vector, because they disseminate all the way around. Another thing in defense of uh, buckthorn is that the University of Minnesota, we have large bushes we only allow to grow this this time. Uh, for scientific reasons, because it's an alternate host for one of the rust fungi that infects cereal grains. And so all of the genetic variations that can occur, occurs there on the buckthorn. And so they cross these, and they can find out and stay ahead of existent varieties of fungi coming along. Uh, I'll give you an example of something like this, because maybe I'm not making much sense for you. And the reason we have bread on the table is because these guys are out here in the rust laboratory at working to have disease-resistant uh, wheat varieties. Okay, otherwise, uh, you know, it's, at the present time, you all heard of Barlog, right? Norman Barlog, or some of you may have heard of him. Yeah. So he sort of is the person who has fed the world by getting resistant varieties in India and so forth. But now, at the present time, at this moment, in Africa, in Uganda, in 1999, there is a race of a rust fungus that is decimating all the wheat crops. And so that has gone to Iran, has gone to some of the neighboring countries over there, and it's spreading. And we have it here now in a um, rust laboratory on the St. Paul campus, but it's very secure, so it's one of these one of these laboratories where you have one chamber and walk through the other chamber and so forth, so nothing can get out. <laughs> because we don't have any resistance for that. And so if it spreads in this country, the price of, of bread can just go sky high. So it's, a, it's a, an economic thing, and so we have to be very careful. And so that's why I go back to now the uh, <clears throat> buckthorn. We stay ahead of the pathogen because it also is changing, right? And so then we develop varieties which are resistant before the pathogen has a chance to get it. And so that's why you have bread on the table for a reasonable price. Unless you go to Panera. That's about that. Unless you eat rye bread. <laughs> yeah, rye bread, rye bread, right. Okay, so much for buckthorn, but now, what was your question? Is this the tree that they're going to cut down because it has ash possibilities? Yeah, that's true. There are 282 million. That's a lot of plants. You see the Minnesota of, of green ash. Well, I've never thought of green ash and ash. You look around this circle, all those, it, it's a beautiful circle, right? I think it's very beautiful. That's all green ash. So, if we have the green ash borer, which is this guy over here, uh, it's about one-third of an inch long. And it's very iridescent green. It, it lays its larva right in the phloem the, of the vascular tissue, which is very close, uh, just below the bark of the tissue. And so they kill that part of the tree, of course, the tree dies. It takes about four years for a tree like this to go down. Well, you can't cut all the trees down, right? 
So that's, to me, uh, ridiculous. However, uh, the University of Minnesota is, is uh, recommending that we grow uh, green ash trees. And, and we are doing that in the uh, in one part of the park. Beautiful ash tree. It must be about 50 years old, and it's not sick. It just looked good, but it took cut it down, chipped it up, and it's gone. So we should learn from Dutch elm disease, and we're all familiar with American elm. Uh, as the trees succumb, and we can have good rates of diagnosis. Then, then you rope it, then you take it out. But taking all these trees out, to me, you know, personally, would, would not be the way to do it. We'll keep the tree as long as we can, and then if we see problems developing, and there will, we take it out. For example, green ash also is sub subject uh, to, uh, I have a background for thousands, so I can talk about the tree. This has uh, uh, ash yellows, which is virus-like disease. So <coughs> these are susceptible to the ash yellows. Uh, ash yellows get the tree then, and it comes back. Because as we get sick, we even start to ash bars to go in and do that. So uh, let's save the tree. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. But there are different opinions, so anybody have any Well, opinion? part of their strategy is, budget-wise, it's pretty expensive to start cutting all those trees down and they just can't afford it so they're saying well they think inevitably there's going to be a lot of trees have to be removed so let's take a few each year and pick the ones that have the highest risk or that are already gone so they says you know instead of thinking that we can do everything in one year let's spread it over 10 years because our crew is only so big so that's their strategy is let's start now, even though it looks healthy, that th this is the one that's most vulnerable or it's already sick but, and they're, they're just working at it as they can afford it. Excuse me, honey, we should probably be off this path. Oh, that's right, because you see an ash tree here or there and say, oh, that doesn't look very good. We might as well take it down anyway, so that would be a good determinant. But isn't removing the tree like just taking the host out of the, out of the equation? I mean, is that kind exactly. of idea? Right. Take, take, for example, we have there, a, I mean, is there effectiveness to that, or is that just a theoretical? Well, it is effective because we have uh, host resistance, but the most important thing is specificity. An ash borer will not infect just any old tree. Right? It's, just it's specific for a green ash, also would take a white ash and black ash, but we don't have many of those here. So there is specificity. So if you take its host, out, well, then it has to fend for itself another way. Now, it came from Mongolia and China, and so I'm not sure what the folks who are there. But apparently, as you think, exotics come in this country, they find a whole thing green ash. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Think, for example, you have a whole field of, uh, this is a good example, Victoria oaks, and there's a fungus that now has changed it demolished all the oats. So they changed another variety, right? So you eliminate that and so the oats are And where this beetle came from, the host ash tree was genetically resistant to it. It didn't devastate it like it does here. Is that true? I'm not sure about what it did in China. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and one of the, yeah, that, that's a good point. How did it get here if it started Shipping, in yeah, the containers, the wood that they oh, have for the shipping pallets. Uh -huh. That's how we got a, the Dutch elm disease that came from Holland. That's why they call it Dutch elm disease. Oh. And, and wood coming through. So yeah, you have to be careful of that. Uh, but your, your point is good. For example, uh, we have obligate parasites. And obligate parasites means that, look, I'm going to infect this particular wheat variety, but I'm not going to kill you, and because then I would die. So an obligate parasite devastates part of the crop, but it doesn't kill the whole crop. So maybe that's what you're doing. Actuary trees here, and they're pretty healthy trees, <clears throat> and they're huge trees. Um, back there, that's some huge, huge hackberries, but if you look around, you'll see a lot of hackberries. And I, I call you all know where that miniature golf course is off yeah. Hamlin, across from Como Town, right? <laughs> well, I call that Hackberry Lane. All Hackberry Lane, and the trees are beautiful trees, 
and they're not diseased. And I wish we'd plant more of those here in the city because they would take place of, of the place uh, of the elm. Uh, Native Americans, That's you know, what we these did with berries, ash, isn't it? I can't see any berries here yeah, at these right. classes, but they're sweet. All out. They the birds eat? like them, squirrels like them, and Native Americans use these and they dried them and powdered them and they used them like pepper on some of their foods and mix it with fat, you know, things like this. So, um, deer, deer also would feed on some of these nuts. And it's a hard, hard wood, you know, you cut into this thing. So it's a very durable wood. And, and I don't know, I've never heard of anybody cutting these for lumber, but uh, maybe somebody has. Lumber, sort of. I've made stuff out of that there. It's, you know, have? it's not particularly pretty. It's okay. It's not ugly by any means. What kind of grain did it have? Then? It, you know, it's similar to ash grain in a way. Um, it's, it's stringier though to work with, um, so it's not that easy to so work you with. Had big, it's very hard. Big planks of it, or, or something. I I had pretty good size. Yeah, I cut it down into thin. I actually made a, a replica of a stringed instrument, an old Swedish oh. stringed instrument out of it. So okay. I ended up having it be about this thin. Yeah. So then you put enamel or something on it. Yeah. I have good geometry to them too, also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, that's wild. Oh. Here, here we have a very poor example of a white pine. Uh, this, is, yeah. now, this is a better example right here. So what is this? Three, anybody know? White pine. White pine, right. Fuzzy needles. It's very soft. So if you're camping, you could use this for pillows, right? It makes great tea, too. Yeah. I, I've never made tea. I mean, it has, huh? I've had tea, yeah. It has vitamin C in it over there. Uh, so um, it has five needles to the cluster. And that's normally how you can tell white pine. Um, and let's see. Yeah, and the, the, this is the pine tree, right? And so, what's the difference between a pine tree and a fir? Sure. And that's the best way. Long needles, long leaves. Okay. Versus short needles like that, right? There's other characteristics, but essentially, that, that's. that's the point. I'm a bit confused about each of those five in a cluster. Okay, see this cluster right here where I have my thumb? Yeah. See if you can count oh, five down down at that level. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they're up together. Okay, and now I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah, very nice. Kentucky coffee tree. Well, this, this is a Kentucky coffee tree. And when, I, when I started with Tex a number of years ago, this is a very strong tree. I didn't think it would make it. It's uh, doing very well. Why is it called a coffee tree? Well, we'll get to that. Oh. <laughs> but you can make lumber out, out of some of those trees. And uh, why it's called Kentucky coffee tree is probably the question. But it's, it's a coffee tree. Na Native Americans they used to take the seeds of this tree and carry it with them because they migrate back and forth, right? To wherever the climate is conducive for their overwintering. And so the, the, the beans of this um, come Whoa. from pods like this. <laughs> but let me see if I can... Yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. a big pod. Yeah. Mini see if I can show Yeah, the catalpas are similar but longer, but they don't have beans in. Oh, yeah, here, here. Some. But these do. Now you would take, these are, these are poisonous just like this, right? But if you take these and boil them like you would make a brew, then there's a glycoside, the glycoside is uh, like a glucose with oxygen, and once you cleave them, cleave the oxygen, hydrolyze it, then, then these things are detoxified. And so Native Americans would uh, grind these on their stones, and, and that would be their brew. They didn't call it coffee, we called it coffee, right? Uh, but they were, that would be their brew. A little bit bitter, but I haven't tasted it. But I assume it's bitter. So that's why it's called Kentucky Coffee Tree. 
a lot of Native Americans uh, then migrated to Kentucky where the winters are a bit milder. They took these seeds with them, planted them, so you find quite a few of those. And it's Kentucky coffee, uh, state tree of Kentucky, and I don't know the history of that. So they drank the brew because it tasted good or for a different effect? Well, like for example, we get a caffeine high, is that what you mean? Yeah. I, I, I don't know because I can't put words in their mouth, but I think it was a brew. It may have also cleared, uh, say, a lung problem, like okay. a cough or something like this, and then you just sort of get in the habit. Yep. And once you get in the habit of having a drink like coffee, then I suppose <laughs> you just yeah. keep on doing it. So that's all that I can invent at this particular right. time. We could all try it on our own. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you, you could try it, but... but uh, Boil it first. <laughs> okay, this, this is a, a, a freebie here. I don't have a sign for this. Uh, do any of you recognize this from Coma Park? Yeah, between the streetcar, well, right at Lexington and Horton. Right. You all know where, the, where that is, streetcar. Then there are uh, two or three of these, and they're pretty large. And, um, and do you know what they are? Well, they're, they're the weeping elm tree. Okay. And I knew it was weeping something. <laughs> yeah. and, and they come from England. And th these don't produce seeds, so they're like clones. You have to uh, <clears throat> graft them, you know, to, to get uh, the trees to, to grow here. But we do have a, some in the park, and I was really amazed by why did we have them in the park. But What's that called again? <clears throat> this is the weeping elm. Weeping elm. Yeah. So do they need to be trained, or is it naturally that way, that it'll it'll look like a weeping thing, it's, it's just never grows tall, it bends way. over? So let's see. Uh, it, it's, it, it came from England, and in England, in the England, sorry, it's called the Camper Down Elm. Camper Down. I guess Camper Down must be a place in England where, where they develop on, on estates, you know. And so it's kind of migrated here a little bit. But I was surprised to see it in Coma Park. We have a few exotics here, so I said, well, that's great. But I can't get a sign like we've seen for Camper Down Elms because they don't make them in the place. It's over here. <clears throat> so it's, and it's not an aggressive species. It's, it's not going to take you have over. You to crawl underneath it to put it on the, to <laughs> yeah. on yeah. the trunk anyway, right? But those were very small a couple of years ago, but, but they're, they're right. getting height on them now. So maximum height would go how high? I'd like that picture looks like 30 feet or well, no, well, no these, 20. These probably. Oh, that's 10. <laughs> yep. High, yeah. But now they're bigger. This was taken maybe five, six years ago, something like that. Where's the trunk? It's hard to even see the trunk. It's hidden. Yeah, well, it's like it's just floating. If, yeah. if it's raining, we just get under the tree. Oh. <laughs> but that's a beautiful tree. So if you uh, camper down, like a camper down. So, and that's what it is, and so I'll have to see if I can, they're good trees, I, I want to get a tag for it somehow, so I'll have to work on that. Here we have a black walnut. And this is native. American species, right? It's a beautiful tree, and uh, if this grows in an area like in the forest, it'd be a tree here, a tree there, then no trunk would go straight up. But now, with all this light, it spreads out quite a bit. But it has this dark. Who works this way? You work this way, right? Yeah. Have you had any other sure. uh, black oh, yeah. walnut? Oh, yeah. Do you use that for gun stocks? Or I never that? used it for gun stocks, no, furniture. Furniture, yeah. Well, black walnut would be pretty expensive furniture, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah it typically is. So, <clears throat> so anyway, the university, they were cleaning out some of the uh, old buildings and they had black walnut chairs. Yeah, so oh said, yeah, oh, it used great. to be used a That's lot funny. for that. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen a black yeah. walnut chair for a long time. So now there's a little bit of story with black walnut because this is a resistant uh, a tree to many diseases. And it has a big root system. And the root system is such that it produces the material we call juglone. Juglone uh, 
I like chemistry, so I have this for you. <laughs> Juglone, this is the uh, quinone, the two ketones here in hydroxyl group. And this material is yellow to begin with, but then as it reaches the air, it oxidizes and turns black. So we use this for ink and also to dye uniforms that like Confederates use that for some of their um, uniforms. However, it, this is toxic stuff. <clears throat> so it's fine, found in the uh, seed coat, but also in all these roots, and it will prevent many species of plants from growing. And it's, when you have a plant that produces a chemical that does not allow another plant to grow, it's called an allelopath, allelopathy or allelopath. And so that's what this is. This is the chemical. And for example, if you have this tree here and you try to grow peach trees, well, forget the peach trees, they're not going to grow there. We have some resistance uh, plants to it, but there's a whole list of many is plants that are not resistant. Is the toxicity limited to where the roots are, or does it spread through groundwater further? No, it's limited pretty much to where the roots are. Yeah. Okay. But the root... <laughs> well, I, I mean, that 20, 40 years ago. I learned that by uh, finding out by accident uh, as a kid because had a black walnut tree that sort of came up on the corner of our garden and then everything quit growing in that part of the garden and not just because it was shaded but it just okay. didn't, didn't grow yeah. Yeah. Right. so it moved the garden a little bit the tree. Tree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and this is very important in California because where you have the black walnut uh, then they keep orchard trees away from the street because they know that that won't work but now there's another story too with black watchings another story too uh, I don't know, I wish I could do that. <laughs> How you doing, Garrett? That's three times at least, right? <laughs> Boy, that, that must take a lot of strength. That looks like a lot of work. Isn't it? Yeah. So the other story to this is that we all are aware of the Persian walnut, right? Persian walnut, you see diamond walnuts for Christmas. Diamond. Oh. Diamond is, is, this, is the name of the company. They stand for diamond walnut. So those are grown almost exclusively in California, just a lot of walnuts, big industry there. But the Persian walnut, which came from Iran, came from Iraq, that area, and does not do well in California or in this climate because there are nematodes that will then destroy the roots, but not the English black walnuts. So they take the rootstock here of an English native uh, black walnut I said English, I didn't mean that. I mean a black walnut. <clears throat> and then they graft it onto your Persian walnut, right? Uh, and, and so then and that tree grows very well. It's resistant to all the diseases and has had no problems. So all the Persian walnuts have rootstock made. Interesting. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so there's always a good thing coming out. You know, I said it's toxic, but uh, the roots are also uh, economically uh, feasible for have I missed anything? What was that word again? A lilo, a lilo path? Oh, yeah. yeah, and these nuts are edible. A lilo path. But you know that you get your hands all black, right? You do that. So they're not as easy to show as the English They're not easy to show. Like so you kind of have to take a hammer and whack them open. <laughs> hickory is also very <laughs> hard yeah. to show, right? But and hickory, I, hickory, I didn't know this, uh, the name is, the Latin name is jug, juglans or whatever yeah. it is, yeah? Yeah. Which I suppose based, comes based from that. So, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Do you happen to know, I'm just, just looking around this little swale here. Oh, that's um, a good word, swale. Yeah. There's, do you know if this happened to have been planted like in the early 1900s or something as sort of almost a specimen area? Just There's so many different kinds of yeah. trees scattered throughout here as opposed to a bunch growing yeah. up together. I ask that same question because if you have some Bonderosa pines in a cluster, you have these white pines in a cluster, and trees like this. And I went to the archives, and most of the archives used to be in the old streetcar building. Mm. And then when they moved it, they were all destroyed. So oh, I, no, I haven't, really. I haven't been really. able to find them. That, yeah. But that's a good question because somebody thought this thing over maybe at least 70 or 80 years ago. Yeah. 
to plant this kind of tree here and so forth and so forth. So yeah, just I mean, you sort I of expect to see a bunch of similar trees growing up together, but it was sort of, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, right, walnut and, and the clash. And the yeah. English yeah. walnut, you know, basswood, okay, uh, we, we um, expect to see that, but you don't expect to see a cucumber tree here, right? <laughs> Oh, magnolia. Magnolia. That's a trite name, cucumber magnolia, but uh, but it's a magnolia. Last year there were a lot of fruiting bodies here, and this year I don't see any. But I can show you a picture of it. Unless somebody can spot some. There should be green. Oh yeah, there they are. Yeah, yeah there's two of them. Yes. Right here. Yeah, okay. This, this is a good specimen right here. Yeah. So it looks like a little pickle, right? <laughs> That's why I call it cucumber tree. And then um, I think I have a picture somewhere. Oh yeah, here it is. So this would be the picture of those green cucumber-like protuberances. <clears throat> but now the green at the present time, but in autumn they'll turn red. And do the birds eat them? I, I don't know. There's some seeds in there, but I'm not sure. But it's, a, it's an exotic tree. It's a beautiful tree, beautiful leaves. And so if you watch, if you walk through here, you know, once a week or so, just watch these little things grow. In September, they'll be red. How big do they get? Um, about like that. Sometimes they're sticking straight up. Yeah, they're, they're right up. Yes. Like a little projection. Right. Where's this originally from? This tree. This is native to the U.S. And this cucumber magnolia is one of the hardiest, winter hardiest, of all the magnolia trees. It's not an ornamental, but it's a flowering magnolia. But it's a magnolia and beautiful leaves. And you do a pretty intact thing. Big leaves, yeah. But thank you for finding it. Really yeah, that's it. unusual, just the size of the leaves. It's yeah. from Minnesota trees. So, as far as an exotic tree, I would say somebody's thought about cucumber magnolia to plant them. No, no. no. That was an oddity of so forth. I'd like to know who that was. Is that tree next to it the same thing? Right behind it? Uh, yes. Yes. Because yes. it has a Mark big hole. I wonder how, how long it can survive. The hole inside of the trunk on the other side is. Oh, really? Is, there's a big hole there. Look at that. Yeah, a lot of times those are injuries from lawn mowers, I think. <laughs> really? Well, they, they go around the tree and then... Like, like a little cut on it? Cut on it. Ends up being kind of a weak spot as it grows? Yeah, well this in particular I think would be the circle around scrape. Although I don't know if height changes when a tree grows, the height stays the same. I'm not positive. But. Probably a little bit, but mostly it's... Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, that's incredible. That reminds me of some trees we saw in Costa Rica where you could actually get inside of them. They were oh, healthy. and they're they still healthy. alive. Yeah. Wow. It's a, it's so, what is it, my dear? Yeah, it must be a <laughs> Well, all, all trees develop holes. They belong there. That's natural, oh, that's right? Whole tree. Yeah. But I see this thing has been like It's especially big. Can I ask a simple question? Yeah. When you see like these <laughs> knots like this on yeah. sides of trees, you see them like a thick bump like and send, then this causes the tree to somehow defend itself and it grows around where we have infected tissue. It takes a virus. And sometimes you get some beautiful burls. In California, they have burls like that on redwood trees. 
and they're large. And people cut those because they have such beautiful grain. Where's our tree man? <laughs> Probably know that. And and they make coffee tables out of them. Okay. Just beautiful. So. Yeah. Or maybe turning bowls. Or bowls, yeah. You can do oh that. yeah. B U R L burl. B U R L L. R L. One one L. Yeah. So it's basically a healing process. I mean, well, like the way that we scab. Yeah, we don't know exactly, oh. but, but, but that, that's true because we have nipple galls, and that's the healing process. They're trying to engulf the insect. So here we modify, the tree somehow modifies its growth, and so it's kind of a cancerous tissue also. That's why you oh. don't have anything real good phloem and xylem. It's kind of mixed up like you would in cancer. So would you tend to lose flow on those spots? Here would this side of the tree lose flow? No, because you still have vascular tissue in and around it, and you get some support also from that. So, now for example, you could destroy most of the foam and xylem on this side, but there's plenty of support on the other side, mm -hmm. on most trees, so they survive a long time that way. The bristlecone and pine, the oldest tree species alive, that They'll have just one little strip of life, <laughs> and it keeps going for 5,000 years, practically. And that'll feed the rest of the tree, huh? Yep. It, is, it is amazing how they survive. Yeah. Okay, this, this is one of the exotic trees here, in a sense that it has beautiful, beautiful blossoms. And I'd like to show a part to right, right now, this year, I haven't seen any blooms. I, I see buds. Been. Pardon? Okay. See a bud, a couple of buds up against the sky right up there. Oh yeah. So it hasn't happened yet. This is a strange year because it's kind of late, right? So I'm not sure if that's part. But here's what I want to show you, and that's why I think these are so exotic. Oh wow. These are beautiful. Looks beautiful, like popcorn. <laughs> well, they look like orchids. Don't yeah, they? they do when you look close. And they're not real aromatic, but somewhat. But when you look at them close, close being and, on the ground in clover, it looks like not on the tree, right? And, and, <laughs> yes, <laughs> they, these fall off the tree, and, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Oh, oh, okay. And here's what it looks like when they fall off the tree, right under that that yeah. grove. Uh, I don't know if you could do Jeff, that. When will that happen? What the heck is that? When Usually, it's already done, but this year it's still to come. Still to come. Yeah, by the middle of June, end of June, most of the blooms on here, but this is a funny season, so I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not sure if we'll get blooms this year. Maybe, maybe we won't. Do you know where the torpedo is? Just yeah, up yeah. the hill. That's where they are. Look right there. There's more there. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. a bunch. That's a beautiful. I, I, I should really have a Catalpa sign there, but then it would be off this map. You know, can't mm -hmm. get too big. So we'll ha still have to work on that. Oh, this is a huge, huge. There is a catalpa in a Japanese garden in the back, off the back west end. That I was there for seven years volunteering, and one year I saw these white blossoms. And I says, "Where is that tree?" And it, it was yeah. back behind some other tree. Yeah. And and they look like orchids, like Bob mentioned. Yeah. This is an old tree. Like the well, it's older than I am. So. <laughs> quite, quite a few years. Right. So catalpas. Uh, they are susceptible to, say, verticillium wilt, which is a fungus that colonizes the foam and the and And maybe there's a branch here and a branch there, but it's just, it's not good. And verticillium wilt is funny wilt, so far that it's usually wilt only affect one side of the tree. And the rest, the other side is healthy. So it's kind of funny that one is. So. It also does that on olives and different things like that. Okay, we're moving right along here. For example, I could find the white oak. It's called a blue oak. Oh, I love this. And there, there are two, two kinds, two families of oak. One is called the, the white oak family, and then the other is the red oak family. And there are a number of red oaks, a number of white oaks. And this is a bur oak. And can you hold this for a minute here? Yeah. Um, the nuts, I say some of these, have these caps and they almost encircle. Well, these are young, so maybe it's not the best example. Um, but it's the only one I have, I guess. Uh, yeah, this is a better one. 
and they almost encircle the whole acorn here, see? And th this is a characteristic of a bur oak. <coughs> but it's also a white oak, and that means that the leaves, if you look at them, are not pointed, the edges. You have a sinus of the leaf, and then the edge is rounded, and that's a white oak. And then a red oak always will have a pointed, almost sharp uh, tip to the leaf just opposite the sinus. The sinus is like this, this indentation, and at the end it'll be kind of a sharp, uh, pointed <coughs> leaf. And white oak is very important because it's a very hard, uh, not very porous uh, piece of oak which you would use, for example, in the uh, Constitution, USS Constitution was built out of white oak. And it's good for shipbuilding. So, in fact, in, 19, in 1776, but before 17, 1650, whenever the British came to Boston, they marked all the white oaks. This belongs to the royalty. Right. <laughs> they take all the white oaks. But at that time, trees were very important because this is what the colonists used to heat their homes. So you go there now, you see all these beautiful white pines, you still see some white oaks there. They're big and large and you think, oh, always oh, so beautiful here. No, no. <clears throat> During the time of independence, you could hardly see a big tree like this. It was all used for cleaning homes and it made, made sense, you know. People had to survive the winter somehow. So anyway, that's the white oak. The, uh, uh, there's a disease of oak uh, called the uh, oak wilt, and it's very serious, as you would see in North Oak's section over here, on red oak. White oak has some resistance to it. The red oak is a good, good oak, you know, even it's flowering and so forth, but white oak is much more dense and uh, uh, compact tree and it can withstand uh, a lot of abuse and also for shipbuilding, uh, a lot of uh, use in water type. Okay, this, this is the black oak you turn right. And uh, this probably has some spines to it, but <coughs> I have a sign back there for you to come into. What is this Black oak. Now, this tree has not been taken care of. Yeah. But if it was, if the suckers were not allowed to grow, this would be a beautiful tree. And some of them use uh, black locusts for, for yeah. lumber also. Yeah, I never have. But yes, it is. it is. And the black locust also has the spines. It's an invasive species, but I don't see any wide ones here. Most of the young tissue would have these big spines. But you see some here, right? What's a, what's a rhizome? Oh, yeah, a rhizome is an underground stem, and it grows like a root. Oh, okay. But it's really a stem that will stick Pop out the shoot. Right? Okay. But let's see if we have any. Well, oh, this one's. Can you see? Yeah, let me see. Okay. Yeah. Like this one doesn't have much. The ones in my yard are like. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can see some more up there. Yeah. I'm trying to find some of these seed pods here. But I right here. Oh, right here. Right here. Here, here's one. Yeah. Here's one. Okay. And here they are. These are very small seed pods compared to honey locusts. Black locust has smaller. The seed pods of honey locusts are you know, about, about like that. Now, <clears throat> there's a problem here with terminology because this is a black locust and it has, uh, it has great blossoms and they're very aromatic and very good bouquet, but they're only there for a short time. In France, they use the honey locust for honey insofar that they have bees which then uh, pollinate and also take the nectar out of, out of the black locust and, and they make the bees make the honey but they use the, the nectar out of the black locust so it's a very desirable uh, honey and of course it's very short-lived so it's kind of expensive also. I think they do that back <coughs> east also but I'm not certain whether it's Pennsylvania but I, I do see that they have a lot of black locusts there. Now black locust to me is a good tree uh, they call it invader, but it's a native species here. And so I say, um, here's the way I look at it. <clears throat> I look at it this way. I saw this in Arizona. Uh, it had a tree that was not native to Arizona, 
and it had a big sign that said, you know, I'm, I'm not native here, but I got here as soon as I could. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was pretty good. So as long as we have them, I would say let's use them uh, wisely uh, so that we can use them economically also. Now going back to honey locusts, you'll see some honey locusts later. Now, honey locusts um, got the name from the Jesuits because they thought it was the tree that they used in the desert uh, for the Jews many years ago to survive in the desert. But honey locust doesn't grow there, it was a misnomer. And honey locust is, does not have sweet nectar like the black locust. Hmm. But anyway, it's still called honey locust. <laughs> so those are misnomers. And now the honey locust, you can hardly recognize it because it's genetically engineered. You don't see these big barbs on it, and it's just a beautiful tree. It's an ornamental tree, I suppose. Let's see if I missed something on that. Uh, anyways, black locust. Small pods, honey locust, large pods. So that, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, oh, yeah, black uh, I Just out of curiosity, I'm looking around here. Are you. Um, you're working on adding to this as you go along, or sort of like? Yeah, I, I have to do it wisely because I want to keep it within the perimeter mm -hmm. of that map you know, that you have. Uh, I hardly, I mean, do you have an example? Or well, there's another? yeah, there's just a lot. There's quite a few more right in here as well. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a whole stand of basswoods as well as the, the, the yeah, the, the, what you call it. The, the cultivar. I can't think of what they call it right now. But well, you're linden. Linden, and yeah. Basswood, yeah. Basswood. Oh, and there are two types of basswood here. And there's a red oak down there, and there were several others that I saw that I can't think of right this second. But just, oh, the elms. There's a, there's a slippery elm right here. And there was one along the path, and I think it's right here, too. And they're just all a lot clustered right in here. That's so that, that's a good su suggestion because the uh, red oak, I need a good example of a red oak, so I yeah. do it within this compound. It's over, it's over there. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't, a lot of these I just sort of know from my childhood and don't know, I mean, I know, I know that burr oak is part of the white oak family and how similar they are. And I think, I think some of those right back there are white oak instead of burl, just by the shape of the yeah. top of the leaf. It appears that way, but going too much beyond that, I don't know for sure. And besides white oak being a family, there also is a white oak. Right. The white oak oh, family. really? Oh. Yeah. Huh. And there's also a red oak with yeah. a red oak family. Yeah. Oak. Yeah. 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 Oak's getting pretty, get pretty complicated yeah. in yeah. identifying them. Are there yeah. like tree maps to help kind of understand the families? Like where you could kind of like study. Uh, oh, I, I believe there are. Um, yeah, you, you can become an expert in just the oak family. Just and then that means here, out west, you have different oaks. And, sure. Yeah, it's quite extensive. Yeah, there, there are forestry would have books like that. Mm -hmm. Forestry department, silver culture, things like that. Yeah, like, that's their job. Yeah. I, I, I'm a, more, mostly a chemist, but I do this. this yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go this way. Here's one of my favorite trees also. It's called a white fir. Oh, that's and this is a real fir tree. And feel, feel those needles. What's it called? White fir. Oh, wow. I thought they... Aren't they soft? I didn't expect that. And you, you, you think, you know, like a, like a Colorado blue spruce, you can't touch it. Right, it's like spiny. Yeah, yeah. real spiny. But these are real soft. And then if you go camping, you can also make a pillow out of this. Is this something with, with furs then? They tend to be very soft needle? Uh, not as soft as this, but okay. more or less. Yeah, yeah more or less. Than, than like, like a spruce used to be a little piece spiny. <clears throat> but this also has <clears throat> a lot of uh, rhythm. So if you have a white spruce going next to uh, a regular fur like you see over there, uh, then the white spruce will be a fire up the fire. And then the fur, and you can find a little bit more resistant to fire, but not when you have a white spruce going right next to it. That's how you have an aerial fire. It has a lot of resin, and some people use this resin to line flutes. So the Indians used to use 
you know, the flute. I'm saying flute, but the, what, what do you call these? Uh, yeah, I guess they're flutes. Um, and we still use them. My daughter plays this, but I can't get the name out now. Recorder? Recorder. 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 Yeah, yeah recorder. like a recorder. And they line this with this resin, this little part, and sort of makes a little sound. I don't fight. So um, that's like the only story, only thing. I don't know what else to say about white bear except I like the white bear. <laughs> you know there's a little red tag there? It has yeah, I took of... those years ago and then somebody grabbed that off. But... Oh, really? But here, I'd like to get a tag for this. You don't have a tag for this? I don't think so. I don't think I have one. Uh, no, I don't think so. This, this is still close enough to the perimeter we could do that. Yeah, that used to say quite fair, having Latin binomial on it. But uh, it's clustered, and right next to this, this is the last tree we'll look at here. Is the maple tree the only one that we can drink as syrup? You know, it's that. Um, the only one. Now, usually, when you look into the only one, <laughs> it's just a little trouble. Uh, I, I don't know the real answer to that. It's probably a maple. Is this species more abundant? So. But no, there, there are other trees because I think on the, the um, black locust, the natives used to take the bark and then you have a floam. That used to be real sweet. So they, they used to suck on that. So maybe that's part of the have. But this is Douglas fir. And again, Douglas fir doesn't belong in Minnesota, right? So then, to me, it's an exotic tree for this part. And it goes together with the ponderosa pine, just over there, and this fir tree. And if you look back from the road on this tree, it just opens up very beautifully. In the forest, this tree would go straight up, not have many branches, because here it can open up, right? Because we don't have trees growing on the side. So, uh, Douglas fir, I don't know, it's a good lumber tree, very hard wood. Where's that wood man? Have you worked <laughs> with Douglas fir? I haven't worked with it, no. I haven't, I haven't worked with conifer woods much at all, except for 2 by 4s I know the 2 so. by 4s of Douglas fir, <laughs> I put a nail in, I bend the nail, uh, so yeah. it must be pretty hard. Yeah. Is that the typical 2 by 4 It's a Douglas fir? No, it's yellow pine, I think. Okay. It's, it's more yeah, typical yellow pine from, from, from south, south right? somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that's the end of the tour. That's about all the, the, the voice, voice you have left, left, yes. Yeah. 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 Any questions?